God is good. Somebody say amen. Amen. Why don't you stand together with me? If you have a Bible, you can grab it now. We're going to begin in Luke chapter number 2, verse number 41. As you're turning there again, I want to say what an honor it is to be here this week. And I'm especially grateful to have my family with me. It's pretty rare uh, that we get to travel together, but just as the Lord has willed uh, over their summer vacation, we have uh, been able to be together quite a bit. We spent a couple weeks in California together when school got out. And the whole month of July, uh, we're together traveling by car, and I appreciate so much your pastor and his wife, uh, the kindness of this church family, and uh, they walked in that that house we're staying in, and they were just overjoyed that there was multiple beds, and they could have their own bedrooms, and screens to hook their switch up to, and basement to play in and be loud and not bother me. It's just, I really am, from the bottom of my heart, very appreciative and grateful for your kindness and extending the invitation, not only for me, but for my wife and, and boys to be here with me. It means a lot. Luke chapter 2, we're going to begin at verse 41 and read down through verse number 45. And I really feel like the Lord would like to talk to us tonight. Luke 2, verse 41. Now his parents, speaking of Jesus, went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. When they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. Verse 45, when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight on this title. It might seem a little bit unusual based on the text, but just trust me. Concerning the prophecy. Concerning the prophecy. Uh, it's my belief that, you know, I, we had the, I guess it's still up there, the next level. It's my belief based on my experience and I think the testimony of Scripture that when the Lord desires to move you from one place to another, it generally, I, I, I'm not going to tell you it always happens, but probably 90% of the time, it comes by prophecy. Now, prophecy is what I would call, the Scripture does say we prophesy in part. And so prophecy is God using words to give us a picture of what the end looks like. Now, we understand the Lord knows the end. It's like if the Lord was to take a, a puzzle and dump it out on a table. The backside of those puzzle pieces and prophecy by prophecy is like God turning over a piece of that puzzle. And with every word God gives you, you get a more full picture of what the end looks like. And so... He comes to Abram, and he says, if you'll just walk with me, there's a city that I'm going to take you to. Now, you don't yet know the name of it. You don't, you don't know the location yet because the prophecy only gives you the part of it. Or he comes to Moses, and he says, Moses, I want to talk to you about this land that flows with milk and honey. It's a good land. It's a large land. This is prophecy. It's God's declared word. It's his intention about what is to come. He didn't know in fullness all that that land had. He didn't know where the cities would be and how great the walls or the giant. But the prophecy told them in part. And so this is how God works when God wants to move you from one place to another. He gives you prophecy. This is probably how this church was born. Sometime, however many decades ago, the Lord spoke to a man or to a couple. And that prophetic word gave them a glimpse into what could be and they sold stuff and moved and relocated and began what now is because of prophecy. But the test 
is our attitude towards the prophecy before it comes to pass. And so I want to talk to you tonight on concerning the prophecy. Father, I thank you for this great church, these precious people. Lord, I thank you for the many decades of faithful work that has been done in and through this house. But I stand tonight persuaded of the fact that all that you have said would happen has not yet happened. All that you would desire to accomplish has not yet been accomplished. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would do something in the hearts of individuals and families and the spirit of this corporate body, that you would posture our heart, our attitude towards the prophetic reality that has been and is being spoken over this local congregation. Help us now, I pray. And everybody said in Jesus' name, the Lord bless you. You can be seated tonight. Mary is just a teenage girl, soon to be married to the man by the name of Joseph when she is visited by an angel. Now you can imagine that this would be a pretty defining experience. Uh, think about it now. An angel shows up. Now, she's not seeing this angel simply in the spirit. I believe it's possible for God to open your eyes to see past the veil of the flesh and to see into the spirit if the Lord would will. But this is not one of these occasions. God has allowed this angel to manifest itself in the natural world and Mary's beholding this angelic encounter. As you might expect, she's a little bit troubled at the coming of the angel. And the angel tells her, you've got no reason to fear, Mary. I'm here because you have found favor with God. And what peace would flood her soul with that proclamation. And the angel begins to tell her that she has been chosen of God. That of all the women in the world, out of all the virgins that are qualified on the basis of their moral purity, God has chosen this girl. It's this young lady and it's this womb that's going to carry the seed of the Messiah. It's she that will give birth to the child that will one day become a man whose broken body and whose blood will deal with sin once and for all. The blood that he will shed one day can heal every cancer. It can make any tumor disappear. It has that kind of power. What a privilege Mary has found herself. But Mary's not naive. She knows that from the entirety of human history until now, if a child's going to be born, it's only born one way. And so she asked the angel, just tell me how this is going to be, seeing I know not a man. This is to say, I believe in the prophecy I so desperately want to be a part of the prophecy. But I've got to tell you one thing. I'm not willing to surrender my purity to fulfill the prophecy. I know a child can only be born one way. Unless you have forgot this, I'm a virgin. And I intend on being a virgin until I get married. So you explain to me how I can be with child not willing to surrender my purity. I, I want to see the prophecy. I, I so desperately want to be a part of the prophecy. I just can't quite figure out how. And thank goodness the angel reassures her, well, what's going to happen is you're going to be overshadowed by the power of the highest. And the child that's going to be conceived in you will not be conceived by the seed of a natural man. But... It's going to be supernatural, Mary, and such is the nature of prophetic things. They're born not of the will of man, but of the Spirit of God. And now, not only is this young girl visited by an angel, but 
She feels the glory of the Lord overshadow her. The, the weighty presence of God overshadows her. And in this unique and distinctly supernatural moment, something is conceived in the womb of the woman. That, my friend, is a life-changing experience. Now, I'm going to tell you that I've had some life-changing experiences. But I ain't never had that. I could tell you about some moments, some, some landmarks in my life when, when the Lord called me out of darkness and into His marvelous light. I could take you to the chapel and describe to you the place that God first spoke to me about the city of Halifax. And I could take you to the Airbnb I was sitting in when God spoke to me about leaving. And I could take you to the place when the Lord spoke to me about Terre Haute, Indiana. I've had some landmark moments in my life, but I ain't never had that. And so you would think the sense of responsibility. Now, I'm a dad. I've got three boys. They're great sons. But none of them are the Messiah. And I know you might love your kids. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news tonight. But none of them are the Messiah. So one might think that this young mother now finds herself with a peculiar sense of responsibility. Not only is it a child and her child and her first child. Now you know you didn't parent your third kid the way you parented your first. I know you thought you would, but mm -mm -mm. This is her first child and she's doing what all first time parents do. But there's something different about this child than any other child. She knows that this child is one day going to grow up. And be he who Isaiah prophesied about. This is he who will be led like a lamb to the slaughter. This is he who will be bruised. And he who will carry our sin and our iniquity. This is he that the prophets foretold of. What kind of responsibility is this? And so you can imagine... The concern that floods the soul of the mother when Herod issues a decree and says every male child to and under is about to be executed. He had no interest in every child. He only had interest in one. But if he couldn't find the one of whom the prophecy spoke with certainty, he would go to such lengths to kill all in hopes of finding one. Now imagine this concern turning in the heart of the mother. This is not only her child and her first child, but this is he who will one day give his life for the salvation of humanity. And out of all the world, God has trusted this woman with the responsibility of taking this infant, now toddler and toddler to boyhood and boyhood to manhood. She has been trusted by God to raise he who will save all the the world what kind of responsibility is this and Joseph thank God for a father who could hear from God and gets a word by dream to take that his family to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod and I, I, I Herod I, I know it might look like he's doing the logical thing but I must remind you tonight he didn't move by human logic he moved by revelation Oh, I know everybody's running for Egypt when they're trying to kill all the kids in the land. That's what fear would drive you to do. But he's not driven by fear. He's driven by a word from God. Oh, what responsibility has compelled them and put care and concern in their heart towards the prophetic reality God has entrusted them to raise. And now we don't see anything until the text we read tonight. Ten years pass and we get this glimpse into the life of this young boy, Jesus, who is now 12 years old. And the Bible would say that when the feast had concluded and the customs had been fulfilled, they begin their journey home. In one day into the journey, they come to this startling realization, He ain't here. I have a problem with this. I've got three sons, and they're not the Messiah, but they're good boys. And some days I might want a little peace and quiet. 
but I ain't going to leave my son in a city and go, how in the world? I, I, I'm just speaking to you tonight as a father of three boys. I, I, I don't know how this happens, especially when the child came by, by the proclamation of, a, of an angel who showed up one night, and especially when he was conceived in your womb by a supernatural overshadowing. I don't know how this happens, but somehow they get a day's journey towards home when they come to the realization, he's not here. And the Bible says they start looking for him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances, which is to say they're, they're asking their family and their friends, have you seen him? Do, do you know where he is? I, I can't find him. H have you seen Jesus? And I can imagine how the conversation went as somebody looks back at Mary and Joseph and says, well, he is your child, right? How does this happen? I know what the error was. They, they had neglected their responsibility. They had assumed that somebody else was going to pick up their slack. Even though she was the mother. Even though it was her responsibility to steward that prophetic reality. To nurture that prophetic promise. To raise that boy to manhood so prophecy could be fulfilled. It was her job, not anybody else's. But somehow, in a moment of neglect, she had convinced herself, he's just here he's always been here he'll be here again someone's going to look out for him somebody's going to do it she had neglected her own responsibility so how does this happen I don't know but I submit for your consideration tonight how this happens is a little thing called familiarity because familiarity breeds passivity and all of a sudden, that which we become familiar with, we suddenly become passive towards. And I've got to preach to you tonight the burden of my heart. Because I believe in the prophecy that rests on this church. I believe in the God-given potential that exists in you and in this local body and in this city. But if we're not careful, that familiarity can breed a passive nature. And I must tell you tonight that passivity can keep Bibles closed and altars empty. That passivity can keep prayer meetings empty and prayer rooms closed. And it can keep Bible study charts untouched. That passivity, it will mute conviction and it will explain away sacrifice. That passivity, it'll deafen your worship and it'll minimize your passion. How does this happen? How does, I'll tell you how it happens. You become familiar and you become passive and you start to believe the lie that just because it happened before it's going to happen again just because he was there last time he's going to be here There's, until you come to the realization when you're walking towards home one Sunday that it didn't feel like it used to feel or you're walking home from one conference and all of a sudden you come to the realization it wasn't quite like it was last time how does it happen I'll tell you how it happens because we allow this passive attitude towards the prophetic you see, prophecy is simply God's declared intention. It is a picture painted by words. It is the unction of God, the Spirit of the Lord, moving upon His servant to paint a picture by an oracle, by a word, to tell you what the end will look like. And so much of it rests, as I said last night, on the if. But I must preach to you tonight about our attitude towards the prophecy. I want you to think for a moment now in your mind of a promise you have from God. It can be a promise to you personally, to your family, to this local church. I want you to call to memory now some things that your pastor has preached, vision he has spoke from this pulpit. I want you in your mind to go back to some altars that you've built, some places that you've cried in the presence of the Lord where God puts some things in your heart. I'm calling to memory now the prophetic words that God has spoken over you and into you. I'm calling to memory now promises that maybe have been hovering the earth for decades and still unfulfilled because God has talked to me to talk to you about your attitude towards the prophecy. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Timothy, 
He said, I got to talk to you about this. I got to talk to you about your attitude towards what is in your spirit. Timothy, you were given something by God. How you received it was prophecy was spoken over you. Hands were laid on you. Something was imparted into you. And now that God gave it to you, your responsibility is don't neglect it. The word neglect comes from a Greek word which means to be careless of or to make light of. How does this happen? How do you rise from the glory of the Lord and from the weighty presence of God, from that supernatural encounter, that significant, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the Spirit of the Lord moving on you and calling you to do radical things, giving in a way you've never given before. Pray like you've never prayed before. Sacrifice like, how does it happen? I'll tell you how. Because you rise from the place of interaction and you start making your journey and somehow, familiarity breeds a passive nature and that passive nature causes us to become neglectful towards the prophetic reality Timothy you can't neglect it you, you can't allow a carelessness to rise in your heart towards the things that God has given you, towards the things that God has spoken to you. I'm preaching to you tonight what God has spoken to me about. That passivity robs us of prophetic opportunity. The hand of God working with divine order in strategic fashion, putting the pieces of the puzzle together, painting the picture of what the future of the sanctuary can look like. But if we're not careful in the process, the enemy will use the passivity that every human nature is inclined towards to rob us of the prophetic opportunity. And so what does God do? God says, okay, I'm going to have to let a little discomfort show up in your world. Because more times than not, God's means of dealing with passivity is problems. Hey, Moses, let me talk to you. Let me talk to you, Moses, about this land that flows with milk and honey. Let me talk to you about a future that's hard for them to envision. They've been living under the cruelty of Pharaoh for 400 years. They don't know what it is to serve anybody that really loves them. They don't know what it is to serve anybody that will bless them and care for them. So, Moses, let me talk to you. Let me put something in your spirit that you can start talking to them about to broaden their perspective of what the future can look like. I know they've lived in an agenda. Egyptian system that has abused them and forced them to work to the building up of Pharaoh's kingdom but I want you to know there's a place that flows of milk and honey it's more than they could ever imagine there's abundance and there's blessing there's freedom, there's power there's glory, there's miracles and by ten supernatural wonders, God brings those Hebrews out of Pharaoh's captivity. And they begin journeying their way towards the promised land until they find themselves staring at a Red Sea on one side. And they hear the armies of Egypt coming on the other side. It seems like an awful place to be. But can I submit to you that maybe this is what was happening. When they looked at the problem before them and they got weary on the journey, they started saying things like, Moses, did you really hear from God? Moses, are you sure God really said that? Are you sure that's what the future really looks like? Are you sure God? And they started this mumbling and groaning and complaining and it started spreading through the body and God realized that unless I send a problem behind them, they're not going to keep moving the direction I need them to move. And so God said, no problem. I can deal with that passivity. I can deal with that grumbling. I'm just going to put my finger on the heart of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's going to send that army up your rear. And as they're coming behind you, that discomfort, that problem is going to force you to keep moving in the direction I told you to move from the very beginning. I'm telling somebody tonight in the Holy Ghost, don't you be discouraged about the problems in your life. Don't you hang your head about, I know, I know the enemy wants to lie to you and tell you God's forgotten you and God's forsaken you and God's left you by the wayside but I'm preaching to you tonight that even your problems are in the hand of God even the trauma and the trial and the trouble is in the hand of God and he's using it to move you towards your prophetic promise even Mary even Mary 
I want you to think about this now. She'd been visited by an angel. An angel talked to her. The glory of the Lord overshadowed her. That's how this child came to be. Uh, I don't know how it happens, but somewhere between conception and the time of delivery, she got a little bit passive. So how do you know that preacher? Well, because I have a little feeling. She probably knew what Micah 5 and 2 said. I have a feeling. I want one thing about the Jewish people. They know the Old Testament scriptures. I have a feeling that she was well acquainted with the prophetic word. It said when the Messiah comes, he's going to be born in a place called Bethlehem. So think with me now. If you were the woman that's been visited by an angel, if you were the woman that's been overshadowed by the Spirit, if that baby kicking in your, if you really believe the feet pushing on your belly is he who will one day save the world, I think you'd be doing everything you could to reserve your room in Bethlehem. But evidently, they became passive. No problem. God says, I'll just put my finger on the heart of an earthly ruler. And I'll put a little thought in his mind that he ought to call for a census. And when your spiritual sensitivity and your knowledge of the word was not sufficient to put you in position for the prophetic reality I put in your life, no problem. I'll just use a little problem. I'll use your national citizenship to beckon you back by census and by the paying of taxes. That's how I'll get you in position. Now, I know not, there ain't, don't you lie tonight. There ain't one of you in this room that likes paying your taxes. They told me taxes were a lot less in America than Canada. Well, by the time you pay health care, I'm not sure that's true. I don't like taxes. But God used the tax system to position the woman who would give birth to the Messiah. I'm preaching to you tonight. Your problems are in the hand of God. He uses them to strategically move you about, to get you where you need to be so his promise can be fulfilled. Now, had they been where they needed to be, I, I tell you, Joseph, you know what? He'd have been pulling up the Hilton Honors app on his phone. He'd have had a hotel room already reserved. He'd have had reservations at the best hospital in town. But they neglected it. They became careless toward it. They became passive. And now they show up looking for a room. Sorry, ain't got no room. How in the world does it happen? I'll tell you how. We become passive towards the prophecy. Spirit of the Lord moved on that prophet of old and he stood up and he said in the last days saith God I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh Joel stood, Peter stood up in the same prophetic vein he prophesied it again even he who, who, who was not for the, 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 the Gentile people they were so focused on the Jews God said it's going beyond the nation of Israel it's going beyond the Jewish ethnicity but you know what they didn't start moving the way God wanted them to move God said no problem I'll just put my finger on the heart of an earthly ruler and I'll send a little persecution against my body. You, you, you didn't want to move beyond Jerusalem? No problem. I'll let a little, little trouble show up in your life. And now the pressure of your earthly problem will bring you into alignment with what the prophecy said in the beginning. And so I'm asking you tonight, what is your attitude towards the prophecy what is your attitude concerning the thing God has spoken he would say in the next verse of 1st Timothy Timothy meditate upon these things give yourself wholly to them he didn't say partly he didn't say just give yourself to it on Sunday morning he didn't say give yourself to it on a Wednesday night he didn't say give yourself to it at a quarterly revival he said you got to give yourself wholly to it and listen there's a lot of things I still got to learn but there's one thing I've learned so far it's that I can trust God I'm preaching to you something that I have proved in my life Because when I got saved, I had a lot of student loan debt. I had a lot of junk I brought into my relationship with God. And I had a lot of things I battled. But one night at an altar, God met me. And he gave me a word. And you know what he said? He said, Dan, like a seed, you're going to have to fall into the ground and die. 
And when you do, provision's going to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And the mountain of debt will be no more. And let me tell you, I got up from that word and I shouted. But God didn't tell me it was going to take 10 years. God didn't tell me I was going to have to juggle three jobs for 10 years, barely scraping by. God didn't tell me about the pain and the heartache and the struggle and the fight. And you know what I did? I lived by the prophecy. On more than one occasion, I stood in offices that offered me jobs with more money than I'd ever dreamed of. It was unlike anything. I, and I, here I am at a crossroads. I can fix my eyes towards security and career and income. Or I can say, no, Dan, God told you to come to this city to help your pastor build a church. God told you to come here to sacrifice and to labor and to teach you some things. Dan did not give you a word, did not tell you if you would just die. I, that I would do it did not tell you I would send it from the north south east and the west yeah God you did then what are you going to do What's your attitude concerning the prophecy? Do you believe what I told you? Are you going to keep slugging it out? Or are you going to try to take matters into your own hands? And so when my pastor came to me in 2018, he said, "Hey, I, I think we can make you full time at the church." That meant full time hours, not full time pay. And I go to tell my boss, I'm leaving. I'm done with the hotel. I can go full time at the church. And they said, we were just getting ready to promote you. Well, what's the church going to pay you? And they were offering me more than double what the church would give me. And I had to look her in the eye and say, no, this isn't about money. This has nothing to do with career. No, I fixed my eyes on the kingdom a long time ago. I, I, I determined the values that govern my life and the process for making decisions. I settled this a long time ago at an altar that God gave me a word. And I, my attitude, I'm telling you, my attitude towards that prophecy kept me in position. Ten years. You know how many times in those 10 years I had to come back to an altar and kill my flesh and crucify my flesh and, and, and make sure I was in subjection and in submission to the Word of God because there were opportunities and there were easier roads. And at the crossroads, I had to decide, how am I going to do this? What is my attitude concerning the prophecy? Either you believe it or you don't. And so when the Lord spoke to me in 2019, it's been a three-year process of God talking to me, but in September 2019, the Lord spoke to me, it's time to leave. And so I had to go back and have a conversation with the Lord. God, I've told you this before, but I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you ask, and I mean it. But almost 10 years ago, you gave me a word, and you haven't fulfilled it yet. And I can't, I can't go around and ask people to support us and to go overseas for a season. I can't do that if I've got all this debt. And you told me you were going to do this, God. I need, you to, I need you to help me. So we start selling everything we own. When we left Halifax in December of 2019, everything we owned fit in the back of our little Jeep. My wife and I, three kids and a trunk full of stuff and suitcases. Trying to pay off debt, sold all of our furniture, sold all of our stuff, gave it, trying to be a good steward. We planned six months of travel, living in my parents' basement. Talk about ego. Yeah, God will deal with your ego. He'll put you in your parents' basement and your in laws' little two bedroom townhouse. He'll put your family of five in bunk beds and a two bedroom, one bath townhouse for three months. Talk about ego. I'll tell you, God knows how to deal with me. I plan, okay, we're going to travel for six months. We've, we've got rid of all of our living expenses. We're going to deal with this debt before we get overseas. I had it all planned. Plane tickets bought, schedule made. I thought I figured it out. And then this thing called COVID showed up. I was in Cabot, Arkansas. I called home and trying to figure out what to do. And Brother Woodward said, there's a lot of uncertainty. What's going to happen? This is March of 2020. I mean, they're talking about the world shutting down. They might close all these borders. You need to get home to your family. And so I fly home, and within four days, my schedule disappeared. Dan wasn't preaching anywhere. Dan wasn't traveling anywhere. Dan had all these plane tickets he wasn't getting reimbursed for. 
I had it figured out. I, I, I thought I knew how God was going to do this. And now here I am backed into the most uncomfortable, unpredictable place I had ever been. And as I'm getting ready to board that airplane, sitting at the gate in Cabot, Arkansas, I go to set my coffee cup down and there's a dime laying by my foot. And the Holy Ghost speaks to me and says, trust me. So I picked that dime up and I put it in my wallet. And I came home. And here my family of five is living with my in-laws in a two-bedroom, one-bath townhouse for the next 90 days of lockdown. I'm preaching to you what I've lived. I know my problems are in the hand of God. Because you know what I saw in the next 60 days? I saw what Malachi 3 talked about. I've preached it. I've recited it at offering time. But i got to be honest with you, I ain't never lived it before. But I did in those 60 days. You know the part where it talks about, see if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you do not have room enough to contain? In 60 days, God put $110,000 through my hands. When I tell you it came from the north, south, east, and the west, I mean it. It literally came from all over the world. Pastors, missionaries, people that didn't even, aren't even in the church, people that have never been in the church, people that I grew up with that hadn't talked to in years, people that had visited our church five and six years earlier that I had never talked to. I'm telling you, it came from the north, south, east, and the west. You clap. That's a pretty good miracle by my book. I rejoiced about it then and I still rejoice about it now. But I got to tell you something. You know how I got there? I got there by 10 years of suffering and trial and trauma and hardship. It wasn't easy. It was a hard road. And when I had decisions to make, do you know how I did it? I did it concerning the prophecy. I had people who didn't understand it. I had good, well-meaning people come to me and say, you know, you really ought to go back to school. You really ought, ought to go get a degree. You could take better care of your family if you did this or you did that. But the problem was they didn't have the encounter that I had. They didn't have the word I had. They didn't know what God said to me. And I'm preaching to you tonight. What is your attitude concerning the prophecy? Because he didn't say... You, you just give yourself to it a day a week. No. He said you've got to give yourself wholly to it. I'm, talk, I'm telling I have made life decisions based on what God says. I know for some people that's, but, but th this is just how we live. I don't know any other way. When I moved overseas, I was ready to move forever. A lot of people thought it was going to be forever. I did too. But five days after we told our church that we were moving to Europe, a prophet walked up to me at a wedding. And he said, I've got to tell you something. I said, yes, sir. He said, the Lord just showed me you're crossing the Atlantic Ocean, but you're coming back. Well, Lord. And he could see the confusion in my face. He said, don't get me wrong. You have to go. And I don't know when you're coming back, and I don't know how God's going to do it. I just know the Lord hasn't released you from North America. I'm talking to you. This is how I live my life. You know why I ended up in Terre Haute, Indiana? I ended up in Indiana because we were here for a meeting in St. Louis one day, and it got canceled, and I knew I could stay for free in Terre Haute. So I called Brother Shock, and I said, hey, I'm stranded in St. Louis for five days. Do you think if we drive over there, we could stay for free in one of those church apartments? And I get in Terre Haute, and I feel that same thing I've felt so many times in my life. And the Lord starts talking to me. And I call my wife, who's on the other side of the world in Europe. I say, Haley, this is where we're going to be. Oh, what, what, what do you mean? I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. I'm a Canadian citizen. I can't just show up at the border and tell you that I'm moving in. There's a lot of pieces to this prophetic puzzle. And then I meet a man one day, and I meet him, and I walk away from that meeting, and I say to my wife, I don't know what it looks like. It's the first time I've ever met this man, but I'm telling you, he's going to facilitate something in our future. 
I'm telling you, this is how I have learned to live my life. I've learned that these prophetic moments, these pictures of prophecy, these words from God are like pieces of a puzzle that God lets you begin to put together. But He comes and He checks on you to judge your attitude concerning the prophecy. And the Lord would like to ask this church tonight, what is your attitude concerning the prophecy? I'm not talking about on a few days of a quarterly revival. I'm talking about how you live your life. What's your attitude towards it? Are, are, are you just making your decisions based on what makes sense financially? Or oh, what's the best career path? Or oh, what's the most lucrative opportunity? Or, or is it about the kingdom? And in those times... When passivity shows up in our world, as it so often does, because we're all human, God says, no problem. I'll just use a little problem. And that problem brings discomfort, and that discomfort brings awareness to the divine reality that God had spoken to us at the beginning. We know what Paul said, that all things work together for good. But the fact is, we don't often talk about how good is defined. Because sometimes good in God's eyes is loss in ours. Sometimes good in God's eyes is discomfort in ours. Because good's not measured by how it affects you, but by how it affects His purpose. So now we're forced to consider the problem in our life in a different perspective because it might actually be in the hand of God used in the sovereignty of God to move us towards the prophetic reality He spoke to us about at the beginning. The fact is, even your sickness is in the hand of God. Your cancer is in the hand of God. Your family trauma is in the hand of God. Your financial difficulty is in the hand of God. Whatever it might be, it's at the mercy of the prophecy. Because until 2020, I lived my life with an ongoing frustration that my circumstance was always at war with my prophecy. But God showed me in a little thing called COVID that disrupted me as well as a whole lot of the world. God showed me that my circumstance is not in conflict with my prophecy, but circumstance is actually the avenue by which prophecy comes to pass. And sometimes our constant fight, our constant uh, opposition with the opposition in our life is in fact us opposing the avenue by which the prophetic word will come to pass. I say again, good is not measured by how it affects you, but by how it affects His purpose. Our keyboard can come back. Meditate upon these things. That word meditate, it literally means to care for or attend to carefully. He was talking to Timothy about his attitude towards the prophecy. Timothy, I've got to remind you, God put something in you. He got it by the word of prophecy. Something was imparted to you and hands were laid on you. But now I've got to talk to you about your attitude towards that thing. Look, I mean no disrespect. But I feel tension in my spirit because I know I'm not an elder, but I'm not as young as I used to be. And I, I'm not as naive as I was when I first turned my eyes towards the ministry 15 years ago. And I've become troubled a little bit in my life because I'll see some of these churches and men and it's like, you've been there for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. There's no change in the church. There's no push for revival. There's no harvest. And I understand that some things are beyond our control. 
I understand there's fights and there's struggles. I understand. But while that church is just plodding along the highway of complacency, I've observed the same men who lead churches in complacency have businesses that prosper. And I just got to be honest with you. When I see all the diligent care they put into their side business, and the business starts booming, and one location becomes two, and two become three, and that church is just spiraling into decline. Now, it's not that the field's not white. I'll tell you what it is. They've got the wrong attitude concerning the prophecy. That's why Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Because when you signed up for this kingdom, you became part of a prophetic people in a prophetic reality. God told you what the end looked like. He said there's going to be an outpouring. He said it's going to touch all nations. And you should be consumed with that prophetic reality. But in the process, we get distracted. We start looking around. Well, this is what CNN says, and this is what Fox News says, and this is what Newsmax says. And this is what they post on Facebook, and this is what so-and-so said, and this happened here, and this happened there. And all of a sudden, our mind and our conversation is consumed with everything that is around us and everything that is behind us and not the prophetic reality that is before us. I'm asking the sanctuary tonight, what is your attitude? Concerning the prophecy. I don't know what the prophecy is. I don't know what vision your pastor has cast. I'm sure he's put some words on what the next level looks like. I'm sure right now you can call to memory some things that have been spoken from that pulpit. From his mouth in men before him. I'm sure you can close your eyes. Right now, and call to memory some times the gifts of the Spirit moved in this room. And there was a tongue of interpretation or a prophetic utterance. As God made known His intention to you. And somehow, as we just journey through life, we find ourselves like Mary. Coming to the realization we're not as close to it as we should be. We just assumed that somebody else was going to steward him. Somebody else was going to take care of him. Somebody else was going to make sure he was there. But he didn't give that responsibility to anybody else. He gave it to you. I know you're not the only church in this city. But you have a specific purpose. You have a unique calling. You were divinely fashioned and formed by God to do something no other church can do. You have been called to do something that they can't do. And they have been called to do something that you can't do. I'm asking you tonight, what's your attitude concerning the prophecy? The next level... It can be an anthem on a screen, or it can be a step we actually take tonight. It can be a graphic that defines our gathering, or it can actually be a transition we make in the Spirit if we decide to posture our act. Let me tell you something about the prophetic. Moses is walking on the backside of the desert when he sees a bush on fire but not being consumed. And as common as this is on the one hand, as ordinary as a burning bush might be, the fact that it can be consumed in flames, but not be consumed, engulfed in fire, but the wood not being burnt, 
the uniqueness of the moment captures his attention. And the Bible says when he turns aside to see. When God saw that Moses turned aside, God starts speaking. Moses, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I hear the cry of my people by reason of the taskmasters. But Moses said, I've got a land that flows with milk and honey. And I'm about to show my wonders in the land when you stand before Pharaoh. You see it now? Moses' willingness to not pass by the prophetic reality of that moment. His willingness to be interrupted. To take just a moment to turn aside and see what's so unique about this. God opens a channel of revelation into his world. And he starts telling Moses who he is. He starts telling Moses what's happening in the world right now. He starts telling Moses what is about to happen. How it's going to happen. And where they're going. He didn't get that from CNN or Fox News. He didn't get it from scrolling Facebook or seeing what somebody shared on Instagram. It was a stream of revelation that opened to him because his willingness to turn aside. To think all of that, the knowledge of who God is, the knowledge of what was happening in the world, the knowledge of what was going to happen in the world, how God was going to do it, that all of that could have been missed if he would have just kept walking. What is your attitude concerning the prophecy? Because I'm going to tell you, we can do what Mary and Joseph did. We can come to Jerusalem as is our custom. We can fulfill our customs and be void of the diligent care that is necessary for the prophecy to come to maturity and ultimately to pass. Stand together with me. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Hear this. For a great door effectual is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries. That word effectual... It, it means that it's able to bring about. Now, I trust you know this. He's not talking about a door that's framed up with two by four and hanging on a set of hinges. He's talking about a door in the spirit. There's a spiritual door of opportunity. It's effectual. It's able to bring about. What he's saying is God has opened to me a door in the spirit. And if I, if I could just get through that door, it's able to bring about all the things that God said he was going to do. But there's many adversaries. And I used to think that those adversaries were keeping him from passing through the door. But I tell you tonight, God has changed my thinking. Because if it wasn't for those adversaries, maybe he could look at what he judged an easy entry. He could think, you know, I'm just going to take my time. You know, it's no big deal if it doesn't happen tonight. We'll, we're coming back tomorrow. And really, pastors probably already got, already got someone scheduled to come back for the next quarterly revival. And it'll just, it'll happen then. 
I'm telling you, the fear of God. I have watched good men in good churches die short of their prophetic potential because they were a casualty of passive spirituality. I stood by the Dead Sea in March with my feet by the water looking at Mount Nebo thinking to myself that's how close he was. The man who stood before a burning bush and heard the audible voice of God tell him who he was, what was going to happen, how it was going to happen. Died and was buried right there. How do you go from that prophetic reality and that distinctly and divine supernatural power to being buried short of the promise that God spoke in your life? You become passive. And you just think, well, it's just, no, I tell you, it's not just going to happen. And so God sets a little adversity at the door. He puts a little problem in the path to keep you uncomfortable enough to make sure you're seeking God the way you've got to seek God. To make sure you're living by faith. That you're not trusting in your own intellect or your own power. To keep you in the posture of surrender. Where you are in need of Him. Because except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain. So yes, there might be a little adversity in your life. You might feel like it's opposing you. But I tell you, what opposes you also aids you. Opposition is just the price of being a prophetic people. And I tell you tonight... I believe that there is a door before this church. I believe there's a door of opportunity that could change the face of this church in this congregation, in this city. myself in trouble but if you'll permit me can I just speak to you plainly this church has been long full of amazing people it's my first time ever being here my first time ever meeting your great pastor but the reputation of the church precedes us as with many of the churches in this great city They're defined in reputation as being a place where those who come to work at headquarters find home. And I thank God for that. God sets members in the body. But I tell you tonight that God could do something so significant that you're not defined by those that move in and find this place to be home. That God might start working in somebody's family and somebody might show up some Sunday and get delivered from their drug addiction and go back to their family and start telling them about what happened at the sanctuary. And then all of a sudden, a few months later, you've got a few dozen people sitting on the pews. Hey, there's one lady in Terre Haute. 
Robin Hudiger, one woman who reached one lady. And because of that one new convert, there's been over 143 people come through the doors in the last few years. Several dozen of them who are still in the church. Let me tell you something. I've had some people as I travel try to say things about my pastor in the church I call home. Oh, yeah, they got people from so-and-so. Yeah, let me tell you something. Less than 50 in that building on Sunday came from so-and-so. Because somewhere along the way, somebody shifted their attitude towards the prophetic reality and the culture of the church changed. And I'm telling you, you are on the precipice of a prophetic reality coming to pass that will shift the culture of this church. Now you're here in the will of God. You're set in this body in the will of God. Some of you great elders and you seasoned ministers are going to bring us stability. Because let me tell you, most of our churches, though we talk about exponential growth and we talk about harvest, we don't have the ministry to balance the body if God gave us that harvest. But you are. God uniquely positioned you. God placed you here. God put you here with all your gifts and all your experience and all the things that you can uniquely contribute. Why? It's because he knows there's a potential here. But I feel so burdened of God to challenge you tonight that you've got to shift your attitude concerning the prophecy. You've got to make your decisions. Not what's what's easy. Not what's convenient. Not what's most pleasurable. But in light of the prophecy, no, I know. I know not everybody's going to do it. But the sower, he just threw the seed, and we didn't know the condition of the soil until the seed had fallen. But I'll tell you what this looks like. It looks like every decision in your life is made concerning the prophecy. I've been there, well, pastor, we don't really come to midweek because we get tired. Kids got to go to bed. Hey, you know what? You do you. But I made up my mind a long time ago. The way we live is concerning the prophecy. Well, you know, pastor, four services in one week and prayer meetings, really, look, I know it's tiring. I know it's hard. But this is all I know. We live concerning prophecy and we were sitting in a hotel meeting room having church in 2014 when a guy walked through and he said the Lord's going to give this church a million dollar building that you did not build and did not pay for I promise you the moment we heard the prophecy was not the last time we talked about it Pastor Jay and I, we, we'd sit in the church and we'd look at maps of the city and we would drive around the city looking at church buildings trying to figure out, do you think it's this one? Do you think it could be that one? Because I learned a long time ago when God puts a prophetic word in my life, my responsibility is to steward it, is to care for it. And even though everything in my life might seem contrary to what he said is going to happen, my eyes aren't looking at what's happening around me. I'm not looking behind me. I put my hand on the plow, and I'm just moving forward towards that prophetic reality. I I know I'm bound. I know it's hard. I know there's questions. I don't have answers. But what I do know is God said. And so in January of 2016, when we're in a church using their baptistry on a Sunday afternoon, and that pastor comes over to Pastor Jane, seeds the thought about taking over that building. That was not the first time we talked about that. No, it had been a constant conversation for a year and a half. And even the Bible says that the angels desire to look into these things. The entire spirit world is peering into prophecy, trying to make sense of what God said and how He's working. So I don't know if you here tonight have a promise in your life personally that God has spoken to you. For you, 
your marriage, your family, your children. Or if you want to just get behind your pastor concerning the prophecy that's on this local church. I've just come to tell you, you're closer than you realize. I hope I don't get myself in trouble, but I've just got to be me because I feel so restrained of the Holy Ghost. I know, I know he's, he's not like some pastors you've had before. I mean, no disrespect. He's not going around the conference of the UPC preaching everything like Brother Graham. But I'm telling you, he is uniquely gifted by God. That man right there, I'll tell you what he is. He's a builder of people, and he's a facilitator of people. First time I ever met him was when I walked through the door last night. But I'm telling you, in the fear of God, he's uniquely gifted to do something with this local church at this time and in this moment that has never happened before. And what he needs and what God needs is a whole bunch of people that call the sanctuary home to say, Pastor, all right, I, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how. I don't know how you think we're going to get free from Pharaoh. I don't know how you think we're going to get through the Red Sea. I don't know how we're going to deal with the wild cities and the giants. But if you've seen the next level, if you're talking about the next level, if you've got a word from God, that's all I need. Let's go. I'm with you, Pastor. Let's go. Let's go, Pastor. I'm behind you. Thank you. I'm behind you. Hey, I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how we're going to pay the bill. I don't know how we're going to buy the property. I don't know how we're going to reach the people. But if you said it, if God showed you, if you saw it, I believe it. Come on, I'm not just come to preach to you the principle of the scripture. I'm preaching to you from my own experience, from my own life. I'm preaching to you what God has shown me, what I've lived through, what I've learned. Don't you get distracted by the problem. Don't you give up just because it's hard. Don't turn around because there's a little bit of opposition. No, God uses that to rid passivity, to, to get rid of spiritual laziness. He uses that to push you deeper, to call you deeper. Come on, would you just lift up your voice? He arabaya naramo soto yorabaya kosha hataya la maha. Ha yarabaha rabaha yarabaye. He kata rebe yendere rebosi aha kosha tahaya maha. Come on, there's more for the sanctuary. There's more for you. There's more for this church. Ah, 
Come on, we believe the word. We believe the word. Come on, the writer of Hebrews, he said, we got to consider it. We got to hold on to it, lest it slip away. Don't let that promise fall through your hands. Don't let that prophetic reality slip through your fingertips. Oh, God. We believe it. We're turning our eyes towards it. We're posturing our heart towards it. Every promise you've ever spoken, everything you said you were going to do, we've not given up hope. We've not turned our back. We're recommitting to it now. We still believe it now. Oh, Lord. I thank you for every person in this body. Thank you for every seasoned minister. Thank you for every elder. Thank you for every new convert. Thank you for every teenager, every young man, every young woman. Thank you for every mother and father, every family. Let the burden, let the weight, let the reality of the promise settle upon us. Let me have your attention for one minute. I want to give some direction and prayer. Then we're going to pray. They can sing, and I'll be done. But Pastor, Sister Bland, if you could come up here in your pastoral team, if they could just come right up front and gather here before the congregation. The principle of the scripture is clear. As goes the shepherd, so go the sheep. And so we need to rally behind him. He may come and cast vision and say things that in your weary or distracted state, sometimes so hard to believe. But you've got to muster up an amen in your spirit. Get behind them and push and pray for them cover them fight for them and with them all I know is how God speaks to me how he leads me some time ago I was with a church a season of building and fundraising. I wasn't even there to minister that day. But that morning, before I ever went to church, the Lord spoke to me. I was reading the scripture in Genesis. The Bible said the Lord hadn't sent the rain of heaven because there was no man to till the ground. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, There's two dimensions of provision. There's a provision of the earth. That's what you work for. That's why you go to work 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. It's the provision you're entitled to by basis of your work and your hard labor. 
It's the reward of the earth for your work, your diligence. But there's a provision that comes from the heaven. There's a dew that rises from the earth, but there's a rain that falls from the heaven. There's nothing you do that controls that. You, you can't say, send the rain. But God said, He didn't send it. Because there was no man to till the ground. And the Lord spoke to me. And He said, if these people will sacrifice greater than they have, if they'll break up the ground, there is a dimension of supernatural provision that I've not yet showed them. Now, the, the church, it, it, it's seen some things. They had a man put a $750,000 check on the pastor's desk a couple years ago. It's the kind of thing I'd shout about if I was the pastor. Well, I got word just recently. There's something in the works right now. That if the Lord should will and He should bring this thing to pass that looks like it's very close to coming to pass. It'll make that $750,000 check look small. Multiple millions of dollars. I'm telling you, it's the same way that God spoke to me about that day and that moment is what I felt about this night in this church. That there is a shift of culture. I'm telling you in the fear of God. There's a harvest in this city for you. I know it's been talked about. But this couple has been uniquely positioned by God. To build you to reach them. And what God needs is the sanctuary family to say, whatever that is, whatever words Pastor has got from God in prayer about the next level, whatever it looks like, when He rises behind this pulpit, whatever words describe that, that I say, okay. As for me and my house concerning the prophecy, we're turning to it. Hey, I, hey, I, I know it means you might have to give more than you've ever given. You might have to gather more than you've ever gathered. I know there'll be seasons of sacrifice and trial and trouble. But if you want to be able to sit around a table and tell your story of a $110,000 miracle, <laughs> then I'm telling you, there's going to be trial. You know what I did? We paid off all of our debt. We gave larger offerings than we had ever given in our married life. And for the first time in our married life, we had savings. Because that's good stewardship. I'm telling you, what I couldn't do in 10 years in my own strength, God did in 60 days when I just made up in my mind, I'm going to align my life and I'm going to make every decision based on what He said. Would you stretch your hand towards your pastor's family, the leaders of this church? And in your prayer right now, we're committing right now to this. Whatever the next level is, whatever the prophecy is, whatever pastor would say, whatever the call to sacrifice might be, whatever the challenge may be, Come on, now's the time. If you're walking passively, you're not going to discern it. But if you're walking in the Spirit, you can sense Him. 
You can feel the uniqueness of this moment. You can sense the time is now. The opportunity is here. In the name of Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Cover this pastor, I pray. Let the angels of God surround their home. I pray you would anoint him with a supernatural wisdom with a divine wisdom let him see with the eyes of the spirit let him know what comes not from the mind of man but what comes from the mind of god put a favor upon him i pray that you would have blessed his ever decision i pray lord that you would let money pass through the hands of this church that far surpasses that which they've ever known bless them to give to the kingdom globally bless them to build in this city bless them to build in this state i pray that there would be a favor that would rest on this house and rest on this body to build beyond the four walls of this building I pray they'd send out ministers. I pray they'd raise up daughter works. God, you place gifts in this body. Doctors, students of the scripture are here to instruct, to guide, to bring stability and depth and grounding. There's an apostle standing before us right now. I thank you for Brother Scott. I pray the mantle of the apostle will continue to flourish in and through this local body. I pray, Lord, that there would be supernatural deliverance in this house. I pray that there would be a divine demonstration starting this Sunday and every Sunday that follows. I pray, God, you'd fill these chairs with people that need to encounter the delivering power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Let's lift up our hands and receive the word of the Lord right now.
Come on, receive it into your spirit. Come on, receive it into the spirit of the church. We receive it, God. We receive it. Concerning the prophecy, we receive it. We receive it. <laughs> 